Uh, I want to talk to you about the law of God. And uh, Romans chapter 7 is a good place to start as we study the law. It says, Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over man as long as he liveth. Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. Notice the, the question there. And he says, For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. So then, if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from the law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit, not in the oldness of the letter. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? There's, what a question. Is the law sin? Then immediately the answer comes, God forbid. God forbid, nay, and here's the reason why. I had not known sin. But by the law, for I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence, for without the law, sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, Sin revived, and I died. And the commandment which was ordained to life I found to be unto death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. Wherefore, the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good." Was then that which is good made death unto me? Notice that statement. Was then that which was, which is good, not was. Was he talking about the law? Was that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. There again we get the quick answer, the simple answer, God forbid. But sin... This is the key verse, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would... That do I not, but what I hate, that do I. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Boy, doesn't that sound like a good excuse? It wasn't me, it was sin that dwells in me. But you know, I didn't make that up. God put that in the Bible. You say, that sounds like a cop-out to me. Well, take it up with God. You say, well, I wish I'd have known that when I was growing up. It would have saved me a lot of whippings. It wasn't me, Mom. It was sin. Well, we're not talking about Mom and Dad. We're talking about God and His Word. 
And now it says, but verse 14, for we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal. Not I was carnal. This is the writer of the Psalm. The, I mean, the, of Romans, the epistle, the apostle Paul. God says, Paul, the statement is, I am carnal. Sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. When? Present tense. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. Now that's Bible. That is, in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me. But how to perform that which is good, I find not. So he's saying the potential is there. I realize that good is there. But it's not, it doesn't come out by nature. By nature, the wrong thing comes out. By nature, I sin. I know that there's something different, but I'm having a struggle figuring out how to get the good out. So I don't have, no, no, no one had to teach me to sin. Now, you might have been around some good liars that helped further the cause, but no one had to teach you to lie. You might get around in the company of thieves and learn a little more about the art of the shameful art of theft. But you, no one had to teach you to steal. You have a nature that does that. Sin nature. You say, well, I'm glad I got rid of that. Are you dead? Are you in heaven? No, you didn't get rid of it. Amen. You still got it. It's not me, I'm holiness Pentecostal. You still got a lot of it too. You just want to lie about it. And not let everybody know. You say, well, I'm, a, I'm an independent Baptist. I don't got it. I don't even look at bad pictures. Well, I've been around you all. And the ones that I've heard try to justify themselves the most and look to be the best usually are the ones that are furthest from the truth. Amen. One of the reasons why in independent Baptist churches our young people grow up so miserable and rotten is that they're taught that their flesh is good flesh yep. if they follow the rules. You can follow every rule and your flesh is still rotten. Amen. One, of the, one of the great blessings of my life is I didn't grow up with an independent Baptist preacher daddy, but I grew up with a Boilermaker daddy Amen. that had to go to work and try to stand for tr right and had to deal with his flesh and battled it. And he would come to church when he was home from work, when he'd come to church. And he'd sing that song, Amazing Grace, and afterwards he'd stand up and testify. And he'd say, I want to thank God for his grace. He said, if it wasn't for his grace, I'd have to catch an elevator going up just to make it to hell. And the Holy Spirit of God let me know that's not just a cute slogan. That's not just a cute saying. That's the sincere confession of an honest, God-fearing Christian man. 
This chapter, Romans chapter 7, was probably one of my dad's favorite chapters, not because it justified his sin. People will say that. Well, I, you know, I'm just a sinner. No. I, I watched him, and I've seen a few others who daily fight this fight. And they don't consent to the flesh, but they fight this fight. Yet I've seen, on the other hand, I've seen a lot of the sin deniers, the flesh deniers, the ones that would have you to think that they've passed over. I've seen them come along and do shameful, yep. wicked things that embarrass the cause of Christ and re bring reproach to the name of Christ. Uh, so I thank God that I was taught from my earliest childhood that if anything good ever comes, it's because of God's grace. We'd leave church, someone would testify, boys, they'd, te they'd boast, and I'll, I'm not ever going to do this anymore, and I'm not going to do that anymore. And we wouldn't get off the hill of the church, my dad would say, by the, God, by the grace of God, you won't. By the grace of God. And it's by God's grace that I stand here. And it's by God's grace that you have what you have. You say, was well, that Bible? Paul said, I am what I am because of God's grace. That was his testimony. Now let's finish reading. Now then is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For the will is present with me. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. For the will is present with me. But how to perform that which is good, I find not. For the good that I would, for the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Now, if I do that, I, I could not. It is no more I that do it, but sin. Now, if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God. After the inward man, can I tell you why? I'm just going to get the cat out of the bag. The reason why he delighted in the law of God? Not because he was trusting it for his salvation, but it was, because, it, was, it, was a, it was a friend. It was a companion. It was life. The law of God was a help. To him, not his enemy, but a help to him. That was his coach. That was his that was his friend. He, he, he said, But I see another law on my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. And then look at these verses. Oh, Wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And here's the conclusion. Paul says this way it is. So then, with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. So then the question comes, which one are you going to serve? Which one are you going to yield to? The flesh? Or the renewed mind. If you think you're going to come to the place where you have your flesh in subjection, just as soon as you think you do, it's going to flip the tables on you and whip the fire out of you. You'll never fight a foe like your own flesh. Ever. And it never gives up. 
It never gives up. I mean, I've watched it. I, I've, I've watched, I've seen, I've seen it. I can tell you stories of men. I mean, I knew a man 14 years, never moved a muscle. I sat in the nursing home with him and tried to talk to him. And he would tell me the battles of his flesh and his mind. And you think after 14 years of a man being sick and down that his flesh would give up and he wouldn't have that carnal nature anymore. But you're wrong. It doesn't get better as you get older. You say, man, I can't wait till I get old and I don't have these bad thoughts anymore. Well, fellas, I'm sorry to disappoint you. I met them old guys. It don't get better. Amen? Amen? But you, you, you better learn how to fight this fight. In our efforts to teach salvation by grace through faith, we often demean the law. That's statement number one. You'll hear people say, well, man, boy, that law, we're not under the law. We're under, and, and they'll say that, and you'll, if you listen long enough, you'll begin to get the idea that the law of God is a bad thing. And I'm going to help you with that. The law of God is made to be the villain, the bad guy. When in reality, long story short, it's not the law of God that was bad. It was how the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes in Jesus' day had distorted the law. They didn't teach the law of God. They, they taught the law of the scribes. They had an oral law that they spoke. And God's people as Christians, they especially preachers, ought to differentiate the two things. The written law of God was not what was being propagated in the, in the temple in Jesus' day. Jesus wasn't upset with the scribes and Pharisees because they were abiding by the law. He was upset with them. They made broad their phylacteries. They would write the law on their chest plate, and then they had an, oh, their own law. They justified the law. They, they twisted the law to suit themselves, and they would stand up there and give long speeches and lengthy orations, and they tried to use the law to justify themselves, and the law never justified any man. It condemns men. It, that's the purpose of the law. But that's another part of the statement. It's not the law of God which is the enemy of man. But it's the law's aim or purpose to reveal to man what is, what is his enemy. The law reveals to man that he is in bondage. You know what the Jews said to Jesus? They, or to, they said, we've never been in bondage to any man. And not only had, did, were they wrong, they had been in bondage in Egypt... But at that very time, they were in worse bondage then than they had ever been. They were under the bondage of the law. They were bound up under the bondage of the law. The law reveals to man that he is in bondage. The law is not what rules over him, but it is witness against man's ability to break free. The law itself cannot free the slave. It's impossible. I feel bad when I think about the law and I'll, I'll humanize it for a minute, make a human out of it just for a minute. I feel bad for the law. Years ago, an old preacher preached a sermon called Dr. Law and Dr. Grace. And he gave this illustration about a lady that went in to see Dr. Law. And Dr. Law said, I got bad news for you. It's fatal. You need heart surgery. You're, gonna, you're not going to make it. You're going to die. There's no hope. And she said, there's no hope. There has to be hope. He, Dr. Law said, there's nothing I can do for you. I can't help you. And she, she said, but please, there's got to be something you can do. And finally, he said, there's nothing I can do. But down the street, there's another doctor. And he can give you a new heart. He can help you. She said, well, who is it? Who is this other doctor? And Dr. Law said, that's Dr. Grace. You go down and see Dr. Grace, and Dr. Grace will fix you up and, and give you a new heart and, and make things better for you. I can't, she said, but I want you to help me. And Dr. Law said, I wish I could, but I can't. All I can do is tell you you're dying. But Dr. Grace can help you. If you go see Dr. Grace, Dr. Grace can help you. Thank God for Dr. Grace, amen? But if you wouldn't have known, it hadn't been for Dr. Law, you wouldn't have known you was dying. 
You would have gone on in your sins. You would have gone on in, 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 your, in, your, in your wicked state. And that's what the apostle said here in chapter number 7. He said, uh, verse number 13, Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid, but sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. I realize that the sin is what's killing me. Your, your flesh is not going to come to you someday and say, look, man, you got all these sinful habits you need to stop. No, your flesh likes that. It feeds off of that. And your flesh is not going to come to you and say, look, the ultimate payment for this sin is that you're going to die and go to hell. You're in bondage. Your flesh is never going to say that. It's never going to relent. But, some, but somewhere along the way, the law of God comes along and says, not only is this not good, it's sinful. Not only is it sinful, it's killing you. It's death. It's not life. The Bible says, she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. Sin is not a bad habit. The wages of sin is death. It's far worse than a bad habit. It's death. Sin, when it's finished, bringeth forth death. And the only way that a person is ever going to realize the wages of sin is because of the law. The law of God. Now, does that mean that in order to take a sinner and lead them to Christ, we have to preach to them the whole entire law? No, no. The truth of the matter is, law and conscience work along together. The Bible talks about the Gentiles and says that their conscience, they already knew. Isn't it an amazing thing? You don't really have to take someone to a Bible verse to tell them that they've sinned. They already know their sin. Right. Amen. People, you, don't, you go to a man and say, look, do you know you're a sinner? No, no. Can you prove it to me from the Bible? Yeah, I'm going to prove it to you from the Bible. So you, take, you bring the man in and you give him a course and a lecture and you show him all the commandments. You know, the purpose of the law was to show good people that they're sinners too. Yep. Most, most folks already know they're sinners. Amen. They already know they're under condemnation. They already know they're guilty. But once they get saved and they start reading their Bible, now that they're saved and they begin to read the Word of God, then the Word of God and the preaching of God's Word will show them, well, I, wasn't, I was in a lot worse shape than I thought I was. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone into his own way. You know what that'll do? It'll cause a man to look and see what God, how great a gift salvation is. Man says, boy, I didn't know that was a sin. I was doing this, I thought I was a pretty good guy, and uh, man, I, I, I didn't know that was wrong. And the purpose of that is not to condemn the man, but it's to cause the man to rejoice and say, now as a believer, boy, I don't want to do that anymore. You know, the law reveals to us after we're saved things that we're doing that are not right, that God would have us to lay them aside. Because the new, the new man doesn't want to live according to the flesh. The new man wants to live according to the spirit. And the, the words of God are spirit and they are life. Why? Because sin, when it's finished, brings forth death. You say, well, a, a saved person can't sin. You're full of baloney. Where do you get that from? You say, but they can't commit bad sin. But where do you get the idea that, that God rates good and bad sin? Sin, when it's finished, bringeth forth death. Now, I'm not talking about reprobate activity and all those things. That's a different discussion. I'm just talking about your nuts and bolts. Uh, you say, well, boy, that guy lies. I'm glad, I'm glad I don't lie. I just steal a little bit. Well, that guy, he says some really bad cuss words. I don't say any bad cuss words. Now, I don't know if cussing sin or not. I'm, not, I'm preaching right now. I'm not going to say. Amen. <laughs> but, but, uh, uh, but listen, hey, you, you say we can justify things. Well, I would never do that. And I've been around this my whole entire life. This fellow over here, he, looks, he points the finger over there and says, boy, look what he does. And that same fellow's over there saying, look what he does. Why? Because... He happens to not do what he does, or at least no one knows that he does it. And he happens to have some mastery over what he sees as his fault and his failure. And so we, like a bunch of proud, haughty children, point out the faults of others 
and ignore our own faults. And the devil sits back and laughs, and that's why we have a bunch of defeated Christians. Amen. Truth of the matter is, both these fellas ought to be honest with themselves and God and say, God, I know that in me dwelleth no good thing. And God, every once in a while, I get it right. But when I do, that's because of you. And boy, Lord, I sure am glad. I want there to be, I want there to be more of you and less of me. Boy, I want the Spirit to work in my life. And, I, and, and so that man that comes to that place where he wants the Spirit to work says, well, if I want the Spirit to work, then I need to get a hold of what the Spirit wants. You see, the flesh craves carnal things. That's why the flesh loves to hear backbiting and, and all that type of stuff. But that, that's carnal. That's ravenous stuff. The spiritual man says, you know what? I don't, I don't want to hear all that stuff. Man, I want to hear the word of God. I want to hear good songs. There shall be showers of blessing. Your flesh didn't want to hear that. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a... Forte. You know what? Your spiritual man feeds on that stuff. The flesh likes the other stuff. A fella comes along and says, boy, I'll tell you what, I got my flesh under control. I can look at a naked woman. It don't bother me. Well, you're a liar. You're a liar or you're a flake one. Amen. You say, well, I don't know about that. Well, I don't know about it. And any, any lady that believes it when her husband says that, she needs a checkup. But this world, you say, well, this world's full of that stuff. You can't go anywhere without seeing nakedness, according to the Bible definition. So what do you do? Yeah, I just, man, I'm just going to, you know, God made them women beautiful. I'm just going to look at all the nakedness I can. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. You know what you got to do? You got to say, Lord, help me. And feed, feed on spiritual stuff. Amen? That's not the message, but I'm just throwing that out there. Y'all wonder if that's in my notes. It's not in my notes. I'm not aiming at anybody here. I mean, I'm, I'm just throwing out some, a thought that comes into my, my, my mind. The law itself cannot free the slave, even if it desired to. I believe it would if it could, because it's the law of God. I believe the law of God... Humanly speaking, if, if it had an emotion, had a mind, it sees people in slavery and under bondage to sin, and it would, it would free them if it could, but it can't. Scripturally, it cannot. Though the law might have at one time wished to offer hope of salvation, the law has actually broadened the gap between man and God. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You know, the, you know what the law did? The law didn't come to bring people closer to God. The law came to show that people are further from God. It, you, you thought, well, man, I'm, if I can only do these ten things, I'll be saved. You know, y'all heard the Ten Commandments? You know there's a lot more than ten. There's like 300 and some. And you know that Stephen, before he got stoned, he was preaching and he said, neither we nor our fathers, or Peter said it, neither we nor our fathers, none of us, were able to keep the law. I heard a fellow one time talking about Abraham. And he said, Abraham was saved, born again, right with God. And he said, and then, and then, he, then he, he lost it, he got unsaved, and he took, uh, he took that, uh, uh, that Hagar and went into her and got her pregnant. And then after a while, he got, got saved back again. Because he's trying to justify that a saved man wouldn't do that. The same Abraham that took Isaac up on the mountain and offered him to God was the very same Abraham that went into Hagar, his handmaid. Same flesh, same man. Just which nature do you obey? Just which, net, which one do you obey? The same Moses that stood before God and said, God, now you know you can't kill all them people. You brought them out of Egypt and God repented of the evil that he was going to do. And God said, you're right, Moses. That same Moses one day got ticked off and he 
God said, go up there and speak to the rock, Moses. And he's supposed to speak to it. Moses ran back and whacked it twice. Boy, that temper flared up. He said, boy, I'm glad I got my temper under control. I'm glad you did too. I'm glad you lie good too. Because as soon as you think you got it under control, somebody's going to check it. He swore to you rebels. Got mad, lost his temper, smote the rock twice. Got in trouble. Same Moses. Not a different Moses. Not You say, well, boy, he was saved once and he was lost because if he was saved, he wouldn't have done that. You know how many times you hear that nonsense? The same flesh. Now listen. The law was never contradicted. The mind of God, though it's often misused by the mouth of men. Men uh, misuse the law. Well, you know, the Bible says this and the Bible says that. And whereas it was given to select people to set them apart and show them their failures, those same people set it up as a standard of their religion. And what was given to them to show them their faults actually became their curse. So let's go back to number one. In our effort to teach that salvation by grace through faith, we oftentimes demean the law. Now understand this. No one was saved by keeping the law. You've got to get that settled. When we talk about the law of God, you've got to understand that no one was saved. You say, well, in the old, in the old dispensation, they were saved under the law. I don't even know what that means. Because the Bible says in Romans chapter 4, if you would take your Bible and turn there, I want you to see it. I, I reckon Abraham would be considered Old Testament saint, wouldn't he? Wouldn't we consider Abraham as an Old Testament character? What shall we say then that Abraham our father as pertaining to the flesh hath found? Let's read it. Romans chapter 4 verse 2. For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham, what? Believed God. Now tell me how you got saved. You believe God. Abraham believed God, and it, what? Was counted unto him for righteousness. I don't even have to read anymore. But it goes on. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. So a man that works for his salvation says to God, God, you owe it to me. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness, there's not one single work that you can do to inherit salvation. Amen. It's all by grace through faith. Jesus did it all. All you do is accept what he did. Verse number six. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without work, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven, and whose sins are covered. Amen. You say, oh man, David, didn't, David was Old Testament. He was under a different dispensation. He didn't know anything about Jesus. Well, man, he just now testifying about the assurance and the blood atonement. Yep. His, sin, his, his sins are covered. Yep. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. David's, he, he's rejoicing. He's rejoicing. Verse number nine, cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only or upon the circumcision also? For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. How was it then reckoned when he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. Before he had entered into the covenant of circumcision, he was already saved. Circumcision didn't save him. It didn't save anybody else either. It set them apart as Hebrews, but that's not what saved them. What saved them was their faith in God. The Bible says, And he received the sign of circumcision, 
a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had, yet being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that work, that believe. Though they be not circumcised. Wait a minute. You said, you mean somebody can be saved? And not have followed that, the, the law of circumcision in the flesh like that? And that righteousness might be imputed unto them also. You see, the Jews had this idea that Gentiles that hadn't followed in the, in the ordinance of the Judaism, the law of circumcision, that they couldn't be saved. And they taught the people you can't be. And old Titus uh, was a Gentile uh, before he was saved, before he became a Christian. He wasn't a, a Gentile Christian. There's no such thing. Amen. He was a child of God. And uh, for whatever reason... The people said, well, probably ought to get Titus circumcised because the Jews aren't going to like it. And they went to Titus and said, well, to Titus, you know, you know, Timothy did. And it, because we want we don't want to have any problem. So it's your turn. And Titus said, no, no, sir. Amen. No, no, thank you. And someone might have said, but Titus, now it'll make things easier. He said, on who? He said, it didn't help Timothy any. If you'll check it out, it didn't do one bit. Paul, the apostle Paul, wanted to appeal to the Jews, so he, he went in a covenant of vows shoring his head. He said, well, he done that to help win them. Didn't help him one bit. Didn't help one bit. Matter of fact, only hurt the cause and caused people to question the gospel that he preached. That's the truth. They said, Titus, you ought to go ahead and do it. He said, nah, no thank you. I like Titus. He's one of my heroes. Amen. God sent him to Crete. They were stubborn down there. God knows what he's doing. Amen. Titus said no. Verse number 11 says, And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had, yet being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe. You so say, you mean it. Abraham is your father? What does that make you? I'm afraid to tell you. You'll call me a name. You'll say that I teach replacement theology and you'll look at me funny and be mean to me. But God won't because God lists me as one of Abraham's children. It's funny, we're allowed to sing uh, Abraham had many sons in junior church, but if we preach it, we're, we're bad. Yep. Isn't that something? You say, you can't claim to be a child of Abraham. Well, okay, but I'll just believe the Bible. What's that make me? Yep. Look what the Bible says. He's the father of all them that are born Jews, born Hebrews. He's the father of all them that what? That believe. It's a shame that you've got to lose friends over believing the Bible. But that's all right. Though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also. For the father of circumcision to them who are not of the circumcision only, but who also walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham, which he had yet being uncircumcised. For the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the right through the law, but through the righteousness of what? Faith. For if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void, and the promise made of none effect, because the law worketh wrath. For where no law is, there is no transgression. Isn't that something? So I didn't know it was wrong. You know, you know, if you if you go into a city, everyone knows that when you turn make a right turn on red. You all know that, right? And some places you can make a left turn on red if it's a one way. But you know not every state has those same laws. And if you go to a state where you're not allowed to make a right turn on red and you do it anyway, and you get a ticket for it, you can't stand before the judge and say, look, man, I didn't know. Because it's in their books, and it's your responsibility to know. Right? And so here the Bible says, because the law, it says, uh, therefore it is a faith, uh, verse 15, because the law worketh wrath, for where no law is, there is no transgression. So I didn't know there was a sin. 
doesn't matter if God has it written down it's a sin and you do it, you're guilty. But the law comes along to show you that you're guilty so you can get it right. But the law can't make it right because you can't undo the fact that you did it. But Calvary covers it all. Amen? And Calvary makes it so that you never did anything. You say, but I'm a lawbreaker. Not, not, not in God's book, you're not. Not only are you not a lawbreaker, but the righteousness of Jesus is imputed on your record. Not only are our sins not there, but Jesus' goodness is there in our place. That's hard. To, that's another story. Amen. Verse number 16. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace to the end of the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to that which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Now, you know, you can read your Bible and read about, and, and, and you can come to me and tell me if I'm wrong on this, but there are people that served as priests. Aaron was the priest of the, and the Levites, but I wouldn't guarantee you that you'll see Aaron in heaven even. I don't know if Aaron ever trusted God. You study it out a little bit and see. There was a time when Moses put his faith and trust in God. Might have been after he was called to serve. May well have been. I don't know. But this, this thing of, of just all people didn't get saved or trust God or call on God or there was no point of conversion in the old Testament. That's not true. Amen. You must be born again. That rule applies to all mankind of all walks of life of all periods of time. Yep. So understand this, that the, the, in our efforts to teach salvation by grace through faith, we often demean the law and when it comes to someone saying that they're saved by keeping the law, then we ought to definitely demean that. That's heresy. It's easily rebuked, easily refuted. No man ever kept the law. The law was given to show man their transgression, not to bring them salvation. It was given to show man under wrath. Now here's the next point. The law of God is made to be the villain. Now is the law of God the villain, the bad guy? No. Take your Bible real quick. And we can only look at a couple of these. Turn to Nehemiah chapter number 9, then we'll take back up here next time. Turn to Nehemiah chapter number 9. Right before the book of Psalms, you'll find Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter 9 gives a, um, it's one of a couple different places that gives a review of the history of Israel. And it, it uh, Nehemiah is preaching to the people and um, he says in verse number 26, Nevertheless, they were disobedient and rebelled against thee and cast thy law behind their backs. Are we, once we get saved, do we just ignore the law of God? Doesn't mean anything anymore. You'll, you'll hear this all the time out of people that say, boy, bless God, we're, boy, I'm glad we're not under the law anymore. And we're not under the law. But I, want, I can show you some verses that where the psalmist rejoiced in the law. Amen. Amen. If, if, if you're not, if, you, if the law is so bad, could you tell me what, what else you have that teaches you what God wants you to do? If, if the law is your enemy, then why does God get upset with people for ignoring it in the Old Testament? Nevertheless, they were disobedient and rebelled against thee and cast their law behind their backs. Well, that's what modern Christianity wants to do. Just kick it out of here. That's what Andy Stanley, you know, Charles, he followed in his footsteps of his daddy. Everybody said, well, his daddy was such a good guy. Well, his daddy threw the Bible away and discarded the word of God. And his son, the fruit of that, 
is just a, is just a, a mocks the law of God, makes fun of it, and rebelled against thee, and cast thy law behind their box, and slew thy prophets, which testified against them to turn them to thee. What was the pro what was the ministry of the prophets to teach the people repentance toward God, and they wrought great provocations. Therefore, thou deliverest them into the hand of their enemies who vex them. Why did they go into that? Why did they get vexed? Why did they get turned over to their enemies? Because they threw the God, way the law of God. And in the time of their trouble, when they cried unto thee, thou heardest them from heaven, verse 27, and according to thy manifold mercies, thou gavest them saviors who saved them out of the hand of their enemies. But after they had rest, look at verse 28, they did evil again before thee. Therefore leftest thou them in the hand of their enemies, so that they had the dominion over them. Yet when they returned and cried unto thee, thou heardest them from heaven, and many times didst thou deliver them according to thy mercies. Now look at 29. And testifiest against them that thou mightest bring them again, where? Unto thy law. Now look at, here's why. Yet they dealt proudly and hearkened not unto thy commandments, but sinned against thy judgments. What is the law of God? His judgments. People say, don't judge me. I'll just live any way I want to. God doesn't care. I'm under grace. I'll just live any way I want to. You don't think that God, as your heavenly father, has made judgments? Don't judge me. Well, I'm not judging you, but God's word judges you. Amen. Amen. We think we want to teach an I, this idea that there's no judgment. There's no law. He says that he might bring them into judgment, but sin against thy judgments, which if a man do, look at in the look at in the parentheses, which if a man do, he shall live in them. And withdrew their shoulder and hardened their neck and would not. Here, yet many years didst thou forbear them and testifiest against them uh, by thy spirit and thy prophets, yet would they not give ear. Therefore gavest thou them into the hand of the people of the lands. Now, we'll look in Psalms, and I'd love to get into it, but you can open up the Psalms. Read Psalm 119, the longest book in the Bible, but take some time and read it. And uh, I, I've got written down here, it looks like about 25 times uh, or so where the psalmist talks about loving the law of God. Yep. You know why he loved the law of God? Because the law of sin and the flesh brought death. You know, the law teaches, for example, and I'm done, I mentioned about nakedness and stuff. The law teaches against fornication. People say, well, the law don't matter. Well, fornication, that's a man, woman outside of the bonds of marriage want to get together and, and behave like animals. Free sex. People say, well, what's wrong with that? That's just, you know, you're just exploring the bounds. God says all the fornication is against the flesh. It's against the body. You say, you think that God um, sends diseases? And sure he does. Certain, by all means. We have a society that's full of this stuff. But not only that, it affects the mind. Much of the sickness and the mental problem in our society is because of how Satan has used sexuality to destroy the minds of people. Very rarely do you, do you find happily married people because even within marriage, stuff... We don't, you know, if we follow the law of God, the Bible says not to look upon a woman to lust after her. You committed iniquity, you committed sin already in your heart. You know, the Bible teaches those things. You know why? Because that's life. You know, I've got boys and we talk about things. And, I, you know, and I, I can't control every thought that they have, but I can tell them, I said, look, you can make your life easier, you can make it difficult. And you'll see these young people, man, and they're in love, and, you know, they're not married, but they're, they're like, act like married couples. 
but because they've already started necking and petting and fornicating, touching each other, they've got the blood, their blood pressure going. They, they, know they, can't, they know they can't go all the way, but they want to see how far they can go. But the problem is, once you start moving that direction, see, my daddy taught me that a tree falls in the direction it's leaning. And he taught me some other things that I won't say in the pulpit, but privately I explain to you. But you see, the Bible teaches that, makes that very clear. It says, look not upon your neighbor's wife. Don't, don't even look at her to lust after her. You know what he's saying? As a man thinketh, the thought of sin is foolishness. Start thinking about it. Contemplating things. Well, I would never do it. Yeah, you would. It goes both ways, men and women. And, and our society, if, if we just had that principle right there, man, what a difference it would be. What a difference it would be. Our, our nation is, is dying. And the devil knows exactly what he's doing. When you, just, when, you just, when you take the morality out of a nation and you exchange the morality per, for permissiveness where anything goes, some of you have been around long enough to see that happen in America. It's always been a problem. You say, well, back in the good old days, we didn't have that problem. Yeah, yeah there was a milkman back in the good old days. Sin's always been around. But what's happened in recent days is it's just become permissive and allowable in a way that it never has been. And in every society that every society that crumbles, it's because of permissive morals. Allows all kinds of wickedness to go on. You know what you just gotta say, you know what? I'm not, I, I can't let the, my, my flesh is rotten. My flesh is filthy. I can't let it have control. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Got to be honest with yourself. There's no good flesh. Many a preacher sets today no longer qualified to stand in the pulpit because they thought that they had good flesh. They'd enter into a counseling booth and listen to things said across the aisle from a woman and listen and hear stories they shouldn't be listening to. No man can handle. See, how many of them stories do you think you can handle? Probably like none. So you're just a weak man, you're right. And as long as I stay a weak man, I'll be in good shape. Amen? It's when you start thinking you're a strong man and you can handle it. That's when you get in trouble. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you, God, for your grace and for your goodness. Lord, I'm thankful for the, for the law of God that restrains me. And Lord God, I don't want...